Hello and very warm greetings to the Keys of the Kingdom Holy Bible YouTube channel. My name is Christopher Sparks and I'm the translator of the Keys of the Kingdom Holy Bible. And here it is in the red and gold hardback published two years ago with a dust jacket which you can see on the shelves behind me. And this is nearly out of print now. There are just a few left and just yesterday I approved the final proofs from the typesetter for the next edition. And they will be going to the publisher shortly and I anticipate it might take about six weeks for delivery. And also just yesterday evening while I was out shopping the publisher Filament Publishing rang me and said that my book on hell is now underway at the printers. It's called Searching for Hell and I'll get that put on the website and that is exposing the false translation and the false teaching of hell in its every word and phrase. Now why is Bible translation accuracy so urgently important? And yes, as I put in the title, this is a tough message, and please endure to the end. Jesus said, he who endures to the end will be preserved. Oh yes, so he did, and he told some. When you see Jerusalem surrounded by, by military camps, flee, depart. Right, I brought my children up, telling them, among many other things, that there are some very wonderful people out there in the world. But it is a mixture. There are also some very vile people out there. And this is true. And you don't always know which is which. But since God breathed his spirit into me in December 1979, I have met uh, and became a member of the body of Christ. I have met the most wonderful people. You members of the body of Christ are the most wonderful people on the earth and the most wonderful people I have met or communicated with. But is it not true that the body of Christ is sick and suffering? And 1 Corinthians 12:26 says, if one member should suffer, all the members suffer together. And the body of Christ is indeed suffering. And it cannot heal itself, it is unable to heal itself. There are out there so many divisions. There are 40,000 denominations or demonations and 200 translations and still you don't, do not know where to go or what to read. Or some foolishly promote one denomination or one translation. But yes, sure, some are better than others and some are worse than others. But all of them all 40,000 and all 200 have been unable to save the Christian West. I have to splutter at all of them when I read them, when I hear them, when I see their teachings. One here, one there, one or two parts good only. They might have a lot right, but then something else major or several things major they've got wrong. And another group that have got those things right, they've got the other things wrong. And so it goes on. And so our kingdom, the United Kingdom, and the Christian West has been invaded and taken over and deliberately ruined in a process of, of over about 200 years. The UK has collapsed, the United Kingdom. And I believe with all my heart that we are in the short season described in Revelation 20 where it says the enemy has to be released for a short time. No, not Satan with a capital S. That Greek word should not be transliterated. It should be translated and it, because putting Satan disguises who it really is. So it is the enemy, the adversary, has been loosed for a short while. 
So the 40,000 denominations and the 200 translations are under the control of false shepherds, all of them. The number one false shepherd is the false translations. They are all under the dark shadows of two poisonous trees. They are lying underneath two poisonous trees. The Latin Vulgate translation of the 4th century and Reformed theology. The first English translations were made from the Latin Vulgate because they didn't at that time have anything else. So I honour and applaud those who tried to make translations from those for the right reasons until I could name King Alfred, the greatest king the world's known. And then John Wycliffe, who was tormented um, <coughs> and persecuted, but he had the right motive. He wanted to get the Bible out to the common people, just as William Tyndale after him did. Um, but the Earl of Arundel, a Catholic stronghold, made it illegal for anybody to own a Bible. Now I have here the Latin Vulgate New Testament. Novum Testamenti, Testamentum Latine. And at Romans 3.9 it has, Are you de, um, is it 2.9? No, sorry, 3.9. Are you Deus et Grecos, the Judahites and the Greeks? Yes, that's right, the Judahites those of the house of Judah. And the Greeks were the Greek dispersion. John 7.35 Is he about to go to the dispersion of the Greeks and teach the Greeks? John 12.20 There were some Greeks coming up to worship at the festival. But at that John 7.35 what does the Latin Vulgate say? Um... Numquid in dispersionem gentium iterus est et doctorus gentes. So he's not, is he, about to go to the dispersion of the Gentiles and teach the Gentiles, but it says to go to the dispersion of the Greeks and teach the Greeks. So from that phrase, dispersion of the Greeks, we know who the Greeks were. And we know where the dispersed Israelites were and why Paul went to them. But they doctored it, haven't they? And the King James Version did exactly the same. So it's astonishing how they had the nerve to change this word Greek and Greekos to Gentiles, Gentiles. And the King James Version did that seven times. So there is a tra one of the many translation of the King James Bible that is um, under the dark shadow of the poison tree of the Latin Vulgate. And then when the wonderful man William Tyndale, who I believe was a true brother in Christ, published his uh, New Testament illegally and was strangled and burned, he was betrayed by a Judas, a Judas. Uh, I think his name was Henry Phillips, who just became a wandering, useless vagabond afterwards. Um, he did his translation from a Greek text, and he was the first one to make an English translation of the New Testament from a Greek text. And then followed other translations. Um, the Bishop's Bible, the Geneva Bible, the King James Bible, but all these are under the dark shadow of the poison tree of the Latin Vulgate and Reformed Theology. Reformed Theology is the name of orthodoxy. I, I, I baptize Reformed Theology in the name of orthodoxy. This is Protestant theology, and it was just a slight tweaking of papacy. That's all it is. So they abandoned the papacy and they swapped the Pope for an archbishop who wore the same fish hat. 
And now we have an Archbishop, Welby, who's a Jew, dining with what he calls the Abrahamic faiths and encouraging other Christians to do the same. And so these books, I have a selection here to show you. These statements of Reformed theology, let's start with um, the the common book of prayer uh, i've just got this little edition right the 39 articles of faith oops my others have dropped excuse me and so these only allow appointed men to um, administer what they call the sacraments and all this sort of thing and so immediately establishing their own kind of um, papal authority. Then there's this, the Westminster Confession of Faith, another document of Reformed theology. And then there is this, the Confession of Faith and Subordinate Standards. This is the Free Church of Scotland. The Baptist Confession of Faith, 1689. Now, I've read these books. Let me tell you, they are boring. They really are boring. And I do not like the style in which they're written. Of course, not everything they say is wrong. Far from it. That's, that's the pr trouble. They're a mixture. So some things they say are right but some things they say are wrong and they all establish this idea of a lawful priesthood. Well, when Jesus died on the cross, he, uh, I wonder if he heard, you know, the curtain temple was torn in two from top to bottom. I just wonder if he knew this, heard it. Was, it, was it so loud and there was an earthquake? But they continued making sacrifices in the temple, so it had to be knocked down. So these 40,000 denominations and their 200 translations, they all come under these poisonous trees. They are all sitting underneath them and they have taken away the key of knowledge. Jesus said that to the Pharisees. You take away the key of knowledge. And so by the abominations in these translations that dare to change the word of God, in just those that, that one example I've shown you, we Europeans do not know who we are. We have lost sight of who we are. These 40,000 and these 200 have been ineffective. Pews are emptying. Denominations, sects and cults are diminishing. Not all of them. Some of you will probably know of some which might be increasing. And well, good if they're teaching the truth. And you know, uh, two weeks ago, a friend of mine in Brighton emailed me to say he'd been into Brighton Library and asked for a Bible. He was just testing them. They didn't have one. They got all the other stuff. They had to go to an outlying village outside Brighton, one of their sub-branches, to find a Bible. Now, this friend of mine has got dozens, so he wasn't looking for one. He was just making his own investigation. And I've been into local bookshops, and they do not have Christian books, except one of them has got mine. And one of them has got some second-hand bookshops, cause that, um, books, Christian books, because that's what they deal in, just a few. But the major chain store, Waterstones, has a whole shelf full of so-called spiritual books, and they're all occult. There's not a Bible or Christian thing among them. And I went into my local library in Petersfield. There was not a Bible in there. So I told one of the librarians, and he put in a request that Keys of the Kingdom Bible might be purchased and put in there. And I said, if they don't, I could give them one. But he looked up the rules, and they're not allowed to do that. Um, not for certain 
certain things and that would come under it. But worse still, you go into the churches around this area, all of them, and I do visit them. I do go into them and I sit in them and pray and I look around and I talk to people if there's anybody in there and I sign the visitor's book and there are no Bibles. There are prayer books, there are hymn books, but no Bibles. There might be one on the lectern, a big sort of family Bible edition, and uh, of course it's got all the wrong <laughs> translations. It's under the dark shadow what's in the dark shadows of these poisonous trees of the Latin Vulgate and Reformed theology. Now, I thought I was getting fired up in the 1980s when uh, I heard somebody, a big well-known preacher man, saying, we must get back to the doctrines of the Reformation. And I was taken in by that. Now, in my book, The Study Companion to the Keys of the Kingdom Bible, uh, there's a poem called The Harmonium, and that's a fictionalized biography of my um, conversion and um, little journey and um, to discovering some <laughs> um, foundations of real truth. And in there I say about this, that how I was taken, well, it's all in, written in the third person, how this character is taken in by this for a while. And then suddenly he wakes up and thinks, hold on, what about we must get back to the doctrines of the prophets and apostles? Into the bottomless sea with the doctrines of the reformers. And when you actually look at them, they are not up to much. Yes, salvation by faith, um, but plenty else that uh, plenty of other things that are bad. And then I looked into the characters of the translators behind the King James, the Revised Version, and the New International Version, and there are men and women of bad character. I do not just mean that they weren't born again, did not have God's Spirit breathed in them, but I do mean people of bad character. They did not understand spiritual things. How could they? And apart from those of bad character, there were also those, yes, who might not be of bad character, might be of reasonably good character, but not got God's Spirit breathed into them because they're just bishops and decorated academics and that does not open up the key of knowledge for you. So, all these 40,000, all these 200 denominations and translations are under some form of orthodoxy and orthodoxy's lies so with their statements of faith, their creeds, I know there are three organizations around here and I've read their statements of faith. And yes, one or two good points here, good points there, but all of them should be t torn up. <laughs> They're boring and they contain teachings based on the Bibles from <laughs> the poisonous trees. So, now, Israel of old, I've said this before, was taken captive by Assyria because they would not listen to the prophets. Judah would not listen to the prophets and was taken captive by Babylon. Jerusalem, AD 70, was destroyed by the Romans because they carried on with temple sacrifice and international trading and many other things and they were a mixture and so now we have this fourth apostasy because the body of Christ has gone astray. Yes this is all of us. It's not just one or two over there, him, her, them. It is all of us. These denominations and these translations are a mixture and God hates mixture. He hated mixed seeds in, uh, in 
um, fields and he hated mixed fabric in clothing. I wonder who came up with this nylon and terraline and these things. Hmm. But after AD 70, when those of Judah were scattered and those of the house of Israel had also already been dispersed among mainly the Greek-speaking regions, John 7.35, the dispersion of the Greeks, God gave them a new kingdom. And these were the Christian nations of Europe, the Caucasian peoples, made wonderful works of architecture which have never been equaled, and sculptors and paintings and poetry and literature, paintings, everything which have never been equaled because they were divine. But now we are in this um, short season when there's been this, the, the last 200 years or so, this rise of big finance corporations this time of Revelation 20. They've done it by money, by bribery, by blackmail, by threat, by propaganda. Every means possible. Buy over the major institutions and put them behind another name so no one quite knows who they're really controlled by. But Revelation chapter 20 verse 9 says, Fire from the sky will come and devour them, so they only have a short season. Now what is this fire? Well, do not expect real flames, visible flames, to suddenly descend out of the clouds like rain or hailstorms, or snow, because that's not going to happen. What is this fire out of the sky? Jeremiah twenty three twenty nine Is my word not like fire, and like a hammer that cracks, rock in, in, cracks rocks in pieces, says Yahweh. And Jesus said, Luke twelve forty nine I have come to hurl fire on the earth, and what if it is already set alight? That tells us what the fire is. It's the word of God. He came to hurl fire on the earth by his teaching, and it was already set alight. And then in the next verse, he says that he has a, um, if you like, a baptism to be baptized with. Um, if you want to just... Um, transliterate those words but to translate them he had a torrent of suffering to undergo so this speaks of water to try and put out the fire metaphorical language so this teaching of Christ and the word of God by the prophets and apostles these must be refined and purified words words that come out of the refiner's fire we cannot have them a mixture by unregenerate translators. Peter said of Jesus, he must remain in the heavens until the restoration of all things. And Acts 13 cites Amos and speaks of David's fallen tent. I love that expression, but brothers and sisters, what is David's fallen tent? It's us. And Jesus must remain in the heavens until the restoration of all things. And so David's fallen tent is going to be restored. But the 40,000 and the 200 I keep referring to have disinherited Jacob. Now there are 12 particular words. Apart from all its false, their false teachings of Trinity and Satan and hell and going to heaven and immortal soul and Calvinism and many another thing, they have also disinherited Jacob. Now, in this book I showed you just now, the study companion to the Keys of the Kingdom Bible, there is a long... Um, study in there 12 words misrepresented or mistranslated which 
disguise the identity of the twelve tribes of Israel. And you know one of them already. They've changed Greeks to Gentiles. The King James does it seven times. So then when you read that, you don't know who the dispersion are and where they are. So all Paul's letters were to Israelites. Romans one thirty one. He has Paul has listed all the transgressions of the Israelites and then he calls them covenant breakers. Now you cannot be a covenant breaker unless you are already in a covenant. And if you are um, not in a marriage with, with somebody, you cannot betray her because you're not in a covenant with her. If you're not in a friendship with somebody, you cannot betray them. You cannot betray the friendship because you're not in friendship. So they were covenant breakers. What covenant did they break? Oh yes, Jeremiah 3, eight. Jeremiah issued the certificate of divorce and it's in Hosea chapter 1 and chapter 2 when Hosea declares Israelites uh, lo ami. The lo bit means not and the ami bit means my people. And in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 12 Paul again writing to um, Israelite um, dispersion um, in Ephesus says that they were having been made alien from the commonwealth of Israel. They were among those having been made alien. That's one word, one Greek word, apolotrio. But what do the others put? Being aliens, as if they were always aliens. But being is a present participle. There is no present tense participle in that passage. Aliens is a plural noun. It is not in the Greek of that passage. There is one Greek word and it's a passive plural perfect and it means having been made alien. And it occurs again in Ephesians 4 and Colossians 1, just those three times. So the Colossians were also among those having been made alien, having been divorced. Romans 11.23 In my 44 years of walking with the Lord, I have never once heard this cited properly, and I don't suppose I will many times. But it does not talk of Gentiles being grafted in. It talks of the wild olive tree, and which is the um, divorced Israel. And it says, it doesn't say, God is able to graft them in full stop. That's what everybody says. But it does not say that. It says, God is able to graft them back in, or graft them in again, palin. That's what it says. Why does nobody ever quote that? Paul was writing to Israelites and he was talking of the new covenant. Who was the new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah? Note who it was not stated to be with, Jew and Gentile. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. Right, the King Jimmy, or the queer Jimmy, has got heavenly places, blessed in heavenly places. The Greek word they translate as heavenly places is eporanios, and they put places in italics, so at least having the integrity to admit that places was added, and yes, it was added. But Jesus called his father Eporanios, so he wasn't called, Matthew 18, 35 by the way, he didn't call his father heavenly places. It means most exalted. That's what it means. Blessed with the most exalted blessing, the most, um, the most ex exalted spiritual blessing among the most exalted in Christ, Eporanios. So who are the most exalted? Well, you have to go back to the stating of the first covenant in Exodus 19 on Mount Sinai. 
Say to the sons of Israel, tell the house of Jacob. And then he goes on to say that he has chosen them as his peculiar or particular people and possession to be above all peoples. Deuteronomy 7 and 14 and many other passages to be exalted above all peoples of the earth. The house of Jacob, the twelve tribes, were chosen for dominion because God has set his word among them and performed his signs and wonders among them. That is where he has made himself known. Uh, Right, 2 Timothy 2.12, if you endure, you will reign with him. This was not written to Jews and Gentiles. Paul was writing to his friend Timothy, whose father was a Greek, so a dispersed Israelite, and his mother was of Judah. So there is a perfect reconciliation of the new covenant and the healing of the division, the former enmity, which Paul speaks of in Ephesians 2. That enmity was the the enmity between Judah and Israel, spoken of by Ezekiel in chapter 37. And the two sticks, heard Judah and Israel, he says so. Judah and Israel had even been at war with one another. But now here we have the parents of Timothy, a Judahite and an Israelite. Wonderful. And if you endure, you will reign with him, Paul says. And so this was written for an Israelite. And it applies to the house of Jacob. And how can we say that this does not apply to anybody else? Because... Where do we see the fulfillment of this? Exalted above all peoples on the earth. Deuteronomy 7, Deuteronomy 14, etc. Footnoted, by the way, in Keys of the Kingdom, the many references to this. Where do we see the culmination? John's vision of the holy city, Revelation 21, verse 12. I saw written there the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel. Oh, not the names of the Jews and Gentiles. The names of the twelve sons of the tribes of Israel. So I love that phrase. The twelve tribes of the sons of Israel. And the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. So the 40,000 and the 200 have disinherited us with their Jew and Gentile lie. They have taken away the key of knowledge and we Europeans do not know who we are. We have been disinherited and disempowered. Blindness in part has happened to Israel. Now in the stating of the new covenant in Hebrews chapter 8 where it repeats the words of Jeremiah, I will write my laws on their heart, so by your fruits you shall know them. Well, where do you look for the fruits of this new covenant? Which region of the world has produced translations and lexicons and concordances and teachings and written all the beautiful hymns and can it be in all these wonderful hymns we know, Amazing Grace, and the hymns of Isaac Watts. I think they're my favourite. Um, he, he was a real poet, as was Charles Wesley, and, uh, and many others as well. To proclaim the virtues of him who called us, it says in 1 Peter chapter 2. To proclaim the virtues, and Peter's letters are addressed to the elect exiles of the dispersion. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 1 and then he says to Cappadocia and Galatia. Oh so Peter wrote to Galatia did he to elect exiles? Oh but they've been telling you that when Paul wrote to the Galatians he was writing to Gentiles. But there 1 Peter 1 um, explodes that lie for you. And 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16, Peter says that Paul was writing to the very same people. As our beloved brother Paul wrote to you also as in all his letters. 
And there is Peter plainly writing to elect exiles of the dispersion. So, we have been disinherited. And as I say in, in this book, I examine all the 12 words that they have changed to make us forget that the New Testament and the New Covenant is still with the 12 tribes of Israel. And so by those um, abominable and deliberate alterations, you have to say that some of them, if not all of them, are deliberate. Or were they that clever? We have been disempowered, and now we have foreign rulers ruling over us. And this is illegal according to the law of Moses. You shall not have a foreigner rule over you. And we have, so this is illegal. So this 40,000 and the 200, they haven't worked, have they? So, translation accuracy is more than vitally important. It is absolutely urgent for right now. And from translation truth, you cannot teach Trinity and Satan, immortal soul, Jesus going to hell and paradise and going to heaven when you die and Calvinism and Jew and Gentile. From true translation that you will get in Keys of the Kingdom, you cannot teach these things because they're just not there. You cannot get from Revelation 20 that Satan has been released because it's not there. It's not Satan. And if you've got any nows, you can work out from Revelation 20 um, exactly who the enemy is because that Greek word Satan, the enemy or adversary must be released. That Greek word Satan occurs earlier in Revelation in chapter 12 and then in chapters 2 and 3, the synagogue of the enemy who say they are of Judah but are not and they lie. You cannot teach these lies about Satan from translation truth. So the keys of the kingdom is based on um, translating laws of um, grammar, internal harmony, logic, research, text and meaning and with translation targets of accuracy, clarity and literariness and producing translation results so that we have the divine order of the right books and we have the divine teachings and we have the divine literary styles, all of which have been hidden and obscured by incompetent men of the flesh working under the dark shadows of the poisonous trees of the Latin Vulgate and Reformed Theology, LV and RF. So there is no phrase Jew and Gentile in the writings of Paul. It is just not there. It's a fraudulent lie by the King James translators. And they got it from, they got the idea, I think, from the Latin Vulgate. And so the King James in John 7.35 changes Greeks to Gentiles twice, and then in the letters of Paul changes Greek to Gentile five times. The other 20 occurrences of Greek, they got right. Huh, funny that, where it didn't seem to affect things in quite the same way. They were fraudulent liars then, were they not? So after my 27 years of translating, having my head and nose inside books, and then uh, still by the miracle of God retaining very strong eyesight, yes, I need glasses for reading, but I, uh, by, as I say, a miracle of God, I've still got powerful eyes. Um, not as powerful as my son, but uh, the Lord has preserved me. But I have not, uh, these 
translation, translating laws and translating targets do not come up with the same conclusions as these apostate, flesh-natured Bibles of the religion of the flesh, and that is what they are. Men and women of bad character involved in them, and men and women, some perhaps of much better character, very much better character, um, but clearly not understanding spiritual things. Now, the chairman of the King James Translators, um, Lance Andrews and others like George Abbott and um, what's the other one, John Overall, these were involved in persecuting Christians and seeing them to their deaths. Little wonder then that the KJV only cult have called me names like Satan and Swine and one wrote to me, Thy God is a liar. Well, my God is the God and Father of Jesus Christ, so he's calling me a liar. Oh, sorry, beg your pardon, calling God a liar. Oops, he'll answer for that. So this is why I have spent tens of thousands of hours and tens of thousands of pounds since 1997 to restore David's fallen tent But first, the body of Christ is sick, and this is because the Word of God is sick, and it has got to be healed. Heal the Word of God, and you will heal the body of Christ, because they can no longer teach all these foul things, and disinherit Jacob, and give Jacob's inheritance to Esau, and to Jews and Gentiles. You can't do it when the translation matches the underlying Hebrew and Greek. You cannot do it. And somebody wrote on one of my YouTube videos, either yesterday or the day before, ah, so this is about restoration. Now I get it. Yes, he suddenly had the revelation. Oh, God bless the brother. He suddenly had the revelation of what this work is all about. Yes, it's about a total restoration of the Word of God and so, therefore, of the body of Christ because the body of Christ is sick and divided. There are those who already are hearing the call for the remnant, but there are also those lagging behind, the lukewarm, and there are also the critics who say sharp things about us and call us names. So, Acts 3.21, Jesus must remain in the heavens until the restoration of all things. We, my brothers and sisters, are involved in restoration, and no restoration is going to come from what is fallen. So, We need to recover who we are. We need to know our heritage. And when we know our heritage, we know this is an immense honour and an immense privilege. And we do not receive it with pride, but with thanks, but and also with immense responsibility. Because guess what? You are now responsible also for the harvest. And if if your gift is like that woman Anna in Luke chapter 2, who spent day and night in the uh, temple fasting and praying, what a wonderful woman. That's what she could do for God. She was of the tribe of Asher, so she was of the dispersed Israelites. Um, So she obviously was one of the few who did return from Assyria. And that's what she did for the Lord. And there's not one of us who cannot do that. But also, when we know who we are and we know our heritage, we know our power. The Old Testament and the New Testament, the Old Covenant writings and the New Covenant writings, are all about the twelve tribes of Israel. Everyone knows the Old Testament is, but then they think when it comes to the New Testament, all of a sudden it's about 
Jews and Gentiles and churches. Oh, this is translation abomination. They've doctored the word of God. But when we know who we are, we know that this kingdom is ours. And I have some passages here, two passages. I could read uh, many others, but I've just picked out two for you. Numbers chapter 23, verse 9. Speaking of the Israelites, the people will live alone and they will not be reckoned among the nations. 2 Samuel 7, verses 9 and 10. The Lord says, I was with you wherever you went, and I have cut off all your enemies out of your sight, and I will surely make you a mighty name, like the name of the mighty men on the earth. Also, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them so that they can live in a place of their own and move no more. Neither will the sons of wickedness affect them, afflict them any longer as previously. Oh, I will read one more. Deuteronomy 33 verse 28. Israel will live alone in safety, the fountain of Jacob on a land of corn and wine. Live alone in safety. This is our inher inheritance, our heritage. And we can pray with power when we know our rights. We can pray. First, we must pray, I believe, for each other, our brothers and sisters. And I keep saying this, and I know many of you are. We're praying for each other because we're meant to love each other, right? We're not meant to be battling with pride. Oh, I don't like him. I don't like her. We're not meant to be battling with pride and spite and division. We're meant to be working for each other, praying for each other. So we do that. But we can also be praying against this takeover of our kingdom and calling the thieves by their right names and stop calling them God's elect. And I've put some markers in my... Um, Keys of the Kingdom here, Psalm 5. I love this. Psalm 5, verse 11. Let all who flee to you for refuge be joyful. This is what we have to be doing. He's a strong tower of refuge. And we flee to him and we can be joyful. I feel it right now just in, in saying those words. Let them shout for joy throughout the eon because you give them shelter. And let all those who love your name be joyful. For you will exalt the righteous man, O Yahweh. You will surround him with favour like a shield. Psalm 76 verse 1. In Judah Elohim is made known. His name is mighty in Israel. Psalm 147, verse 20, verse 19 and 20. He shows his word to Jacob. This is what I say earlier. It is the um, European peoples who have produced the fruits of the new covenant because uh, um, nobody else gets it like we do. He shows his word to Jacob, his statutes and his judgments to Israel. He has not dealt like this with any nation, and they have not known his judgments. Hallelujah! And similar words in Psalm 103, verse 7, and Amos 3, 2, I've marked in my margin. This is our inheritance, brothers and sisters. But what do we have? Foreigners ruling over us. Now, I also put some markers in uh, Deuteronomy. Um, Leviticus 26, verse 11, also. Um, I did put a marker in it. Well, I know what it says. Um, oh, here it is. Those who hate you will rule over you. They hate us. 
Deuteronomy 28, verse 32. Your sons and your daughters will be given to another people. This is wrong. Verse 37, you will become an astonishment, a proverb and a byword among all peoples. Verse 45, all these curses will come among you. This is for turning away. Verse 49, Yahweh will raise a nation against you from afar, from the end of the earth. They're coming in little rafts every day, aren't they? Invited in by Esau. Psalm 83, I think it's verse 13, the tents of Esau and the Ishmaelites. Verse 62, you will be left few in number, whereas you were like the stars of the heavens in number. So, pews emptying, because you would not obey the voice of Yahweh your Elohim. But he has made his ways known to us. We know... We know his ways. This is all of us. If one member of the body should suffer, all the members suffer together, and it is suffering. And we cannot heal ourselves. Only the true word of God can heal us. So prayer is urgent. And the restoration of the Word of God is urgent. Praise the Lord God. May we be joyful in Him and be also very urgent in our implorings of Him for each other and that He will drive away the enemy like swirling dust. That's what it says in Psalm 83. Like swirling dust. Well, either we believe these words and take them at face value, just as they're written. Well, I do. I believe these prayers are written for us for all time. This is the Word of God. Bless you all.